We don't seek converts. But you know what? It's not true. Judaism has sought converts. There are a few teachings in the Talmud that are very specific about this. For example, there's a famous incident in the Talmud between Shammai and Hillel. They're each approached by a man who says, convert me to Judaism on the condition that you, that you will teach me the entire Torah while standing on one foot. And in the famous response, Shammai chases the man away with a building rod. Hillel has a very different approach. He says to the man, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the entire Torah. All the rest is commentary. Tseul mad, now go and study. And then he converts the man. In fact, in every instance in the Talmud, and there are a total of three, Hillel goes out of his way to quickly convert the man and welcome him to Judaism. And we always go, by the way, with the house of Hillel over the house of Shammai. The very first Jew, of course, Abraham, chose Judaism. And in a commentary in Tanchuma, it says, if a man wishes to convert, let him learn from Abraham, who when he was 99 years old, entered the covenant with God. In other words, at no point is one too old. And it is also said that God says that he cherishes the convert because Abraham was a convert to Judaism. And by the way, so welcome is the person who chooses to be a Jew that the Talmud actually forbids us from referring to that person as someone who converted to Judaism, as if somehow to make a distinction between them and someone who was born a Jew. We're not to make any distinctions between someone who's born a Jew and someone who chooses to be a Jew. And that's very powerful because it shows, and this is so important, that Judaism is not an ethnicity or a race. It's a set of principles. It's a set of values. Ethnicity or race is genetic. Principles and faith and values are a choice. And the truth is, for most Jews today, most people who were born Jewish, it too has become a choice. Our job as rabbis, as teachers, as parents, is not for a moment to assume that our kids are going to live Jewishly. Our jobs as rabbis and teachers and parents is to make our children fall in love with Judaism and to live by the principles, the faith, and the values that they have and that they've inherited, but they may not take necessarily to heart. There are statements in the Talmud, by the way, which show ambivalence towards conversion. Four. Exactly four. But there are hundreds of statements of the Talmud encouraging conversion and actually telling us that we should actively seek people to convert to Judaism. That may surprise a lot of people. It surprised me when I learned it. So why did we stop? We stopped because in the fifth century, Christianity became the state religion of the Romans, and the Christians instituted a law that converting to Judaism was a crime punishable by death, both for the person who encouraged the person to become a Jew and for the person who chose to become a Jew. So we stopped going after people, I'll use that term euphemistically, we stopped reaching out to people. That was 1,600 years ago. And today, I know that some of the aversion to seeking converts has to do with the way that we have seen it done by some other faiths. Sometimes we imagine people standing on a street corner shouting into a megaphone, and that seems a little unseemly. Or we'll see people going on television and saying, listen, come forward and receive God sort of instantly. And we don't find that necessarily as elevating. But there are ways, thoughtful ways, to encourage those who are not committed, those who are not churched in any religion, to think about becoming Jews. And on another occasion, I'd like to share those with you. But one of them can be as simple as inviting someone to a Shabbat dinner and celebrating it. Because you know the warmth of a Shabbat dinner 
it's rarely paralleled in almost anything in life. There are large numbers of men and women in our society that have no religion in their lives. Do you think that some might find great meaning in Judaism and wouldn't that be a good thing for them, for Judaism, for our world? That's one vote of confidence. <laughs> Let me share some numbers with you because numbers here do become important. In 1938, prior to the Holocaust, there were 18 million Jews in the world. Approximately one out of three Jews were murdered. So that by 1945, there were 12 million Jews alive. That's 1945. And there were 2.3 billion people in the world. Today, 70 years later, there are still 12 million Jews. And the world population has tripled to nearly 7 billion. We haven't grown in 70 years. In 1938, there were 6 million Jews in the United States, 130 million Americans. We were 4% of the population. Since then, despite the immigration of Holocaust survivors, of Israelis, of Iranians, of Soviet and South African Jews. Despite all that immigration, there are still about six million Jews in the United States, but there are over 300 million Americans. Now we're less than 2% of the population. I know how many of you feel blessed to be a Jew. I know how many of you probably thank God for making you a Jew or thank your parents for instilling Judaism in you, or a teacher, or a cantor, or a synagogue. There's a prayer that we say in the Berkot HaShachar every morning. It says, blessed are you, Lord our God, Shasani Yisrael. Thank you, God, who has made me a Jew. Because it's great to be a part of a religious tradition. Don't people who are not Jewish, people who are not involved or committed to any religion, have the same desires that we do, a desire to be closer to God, a desire to be part of the community, a desire to become better human beings, a desire to be rooted in something more than just the fleeting fads of society? What should those tens of millions of people who are unconnected to any religion do? Some of them may ultimately turn to another religion, but a lot of them may not. Most of them will simply go through the rest of their lives living a secular life. What a shame. What a shame for them and what a shame for our world. When I first became a rabbi, my introduction to this work was overseeing a program called Derech Torah, the way of Torah, an introduction to Judaism. Many use the course for the desire to convert but the faculty went out of their way not to pressure people. We went out of our way to simply support people's decision. And I met everybody who took the class. It was about 1,000 people, about 500 couples, overwhelmingly interfaith couples. And it was extraordinary to hear their stories. I remember there was one who stood up in the class that I taught, because I taught it five times, but we had probably 50 or 60 classes over those years, Howell and Saruba. He stood up to introduce himself. He says, hi, I'm Howell from the Bronx, and this is my fiance Zaruba from Zaire. There was a Jewish guy engaged to a woman from South Korea from different faiths. But I'll leave you with the story of one couple who I ended up becoming quite close with, who at the end of the 30 weeks of study together stood up proudly and said, you know what, I have fallen in love with Judaism. She was one of seven children from a Catholic home. He was the son of two Holocaust survivors and could honestly, his Judaism was about as meaningful to him as you can, as unmeaningful to him as you can imagine. But they took this course together and at the end of 30 weeks she stood up and she said, I have fallen in love with Judaism, but I don't see myself becoming a Jew. They got married, they had three children. She insisted that the children go to a Jewish day school. She insisted on making Shabbat dinner. She 
lit candles on Friday nights and said the prayers. We spent some Shabbat evenings at their home in Riverdale. He, we'll call him Doug, we'll call her Katie, was fully ambivalent. Every year around the high holidays when we moved to Los Angeles, Beverly, my wife Beverly, and I would receive a letter, the uh, annual holiday letter. It was around Christmas time, and we would get the one-page updates, which became popular, the whole family history for the year on one page, right? You've all received them. Well, they were always nice. One year at the bottom, it had handwritten over, and I turned it over, and she Katie, not her real name, wrote me a letter. She said, you know, I started taking Hebrew this year. And I learned that when I was saying the prayer to light the candles, Asher Kidshanu B'mitzvotav Etzivanu, God who made us holy through, his, through the commandments and commanded us to kindle the Sabbath light. She said, commanded us, but I wasn't one of the us's. So you'll never believe this, she writes, David. I decided to become a Jew. And three weeks ago, I went to the mikveh. I'm happy for Katie. And I suspect all of us are. I'm happy for her family. And I'm happy for the Jewish people. And she, and this was many years ago, so I've stayed in touch, like so many Jews, I, may, so many people I know who have chosen Judaism are among the most deeply committed Jews I know. They're often the ones who propel the other Jew to take Judaism all the more seriously. Some of the finest people I have ever met have chosen Judaism, and I believe that we will attract some of the finest people in the world. It's not always easy to be a Jew. It's not easy to be part of a minority culture, but it's also deeply meaningful and beautiful. And if we're serious, about the Takeno Lumba Malchut Shaddai, if we're serious about making the world a better place and we believe that Judaism is a great vehicle to do so, then we need others to join us in our task. Think about a world today, not with 12 or 13 million Jews, but with 25 or 50 million Jews. Jews who made Shabbat, Jews who might send their kid to a Jewish day school or to religious school, people who avoided gossip or who looked at Jewish sources when conducting themselves in business. Even if there were a hundred million Jews, that would mean eight times our current numbers, we would still be a tiny minority in the world, less than 1%. If we have something great, don't we have a responsibility to let other people know about it? Tomorrow morning, when Katie is in synagogue, she's gonna join with her congregation. And at the right moment, like everybody else, she's going to stand. And just like all of those around her, she'll say the words of that very special prayer. Blessed are you, Lord our God, Sha'asani Yisrael, who has made me a Jew. And the world will be just a tiny little bit better for all of us. Don't you agree? Shabbat Shalom.